you. Well, send it again. I don't know why you didn't. No. Time is up. Time is up. Any more quizzes out here? Okay. That's good. Take it up to the front. Quizzes, time is up. Okay. Time is up. First question, my return on capital was changing every year because there was a different reinvestment rate. You could have used any one of them and I would give Oh, so I did year one. Is that it? Right. That, that's year really one was technically the right answer. That really confused me though. Yeah. Hmm. And uh, with regards to the last question, um, you had said that there was a 20% default. So the default would just be the amount of money that you would get minus the debt, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. You can toss those away. Is that a quiz? Excuse me. Come on. Okay, folks, settle in. Okay. Okay. Hey guys, can you get that group back there? Tell them to just yell at them. Hey guys, sit down, break it up. Okay. It's too late. Oh, that's empty. Let's throw them away. Okay, folks. So the usual rules apply. When the quizzes are ready, I'll let you know and then I'll send the solution 
So I'll, I'll let you know when the quizzes are ready to be picked up. It'll be sooner than you think, so I, no, wait for the email. It won't be tonight. That's definitely off the cards. Uh, sometime tomorrow, probably earlier rather than later. So you can, and I'll send out the solutions. So let's pick up where we left off on uh, Wednesday. We were talking about price earnings ratios and price to book. And I talked about playing money ball. Okay? Money ball, of course, is using data to draw conclusions, as opposed to what? As opposed to gut feeling, rules of thumb. So I'd like to start with that playing money ball with multiples and draw your attention to some very interesting statistical properties that multiples have that make them Guys, stop talking about the quiz. It's over. It's a sunk cost. It's done. Right? Just let it go, right? Okay. Until you get it back. Nothing you can do about it, so just let it go. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about those questions you need to ask about any multiple. Price earnings, price to book, EV to EBITDA. So this was a statistics class, and I gave you a bunch of data, 50 data points. What's the first thing you're taught to do in a statistics class? What do you do? You crystallize them into an average and a standard deviation, right? And then if it's a good statistics class, you're asked to draw a histogram. You know what histograms are? You count the number of you know, observations between 0 and 4, 4 to 8. You put it in a distribution. Why do we do that? Why do we present data in distributions? What's a nice distribution to have for your data where you can do all kinds of neat stuff with the data? If it's normal. So the f reason we put up histograms is to ask, can we get away using all that normal stuff, plus or minus two standard deviations? Then you look for outliers, right? Basically, you say, what do I do about the outliers? And then you check to see if there's any bias in your data. So I'm going to use all of those things we've been taught in statistics on a multiple. At the start of every year, here's what I do. I compute the PE ratio price to book EV to EBITDA, about seven different, eight different multiples for every company on the face of the earth. And then I draw a histogram, and this is a histogram of PE ratios for U.S. companies at the start of 2017. It's a, no rocket science here, just counting the number of companies with PE ratios 0 to 4, 4 to 8. So this is what the histogram looks like. So here's my first question. Does that look like a normal distribution to you? A multiple can never, ever be normally distributed. It's actually impossible, and here's why. In fact, you can tell me why. If you have a normal distribution, what are the, out, in the outer edges of the distribution? What are the values range from? If it's a true normal distribution, it's got to go from minus infinity to plus infinity, right? What's the lowest value a PE ratio can take? Zero. Which means you have the distribution floored at one side at zero. What's the highest value a PE ratio can take? It can be a really high number. I don't know about you, but I remember in my statistics class, these were called asymmetric or skewed distributions. And I never quite got why they had all these fancy names. If you have an asymmetric or a skewed distribution, I was told, never trust the average. What's wrong with using an average in a distribution like this one? All your outliers are big positive numbers. You have none on the other side. So when I compute an average, guess what? The average is going to get pulled out by the outliers. Here's the easiest way to see the distributional effects. I took all the US companies and I computed simple statistics on current PE, trailing PE, forward PE. Remember we talked about current PE used last year's fiscal earnings, trailing PE used the last four quarters, forward PE used the next four quarters. I computed that for every company. So let's take current PE. There were 7,330 companies in my sample of US companies. But I was able to get a PE for only 3,076. So here's, what happened to the other 4,000 something, 4,300 companies? Where did they go? Why did I have to take them out of the distribution? Is that right? Well, that would be a lot of outliers, right? 4,000 outliers. I've been going crazy with outliers if I did that. That would be a dangerous thing to do, actually, if I had that many outliers I was removing. Negative earnings. In fact, if you have a company with negative earnings per share, think of what happens to the P-E ratio. It's not meaningful. I've lost 60% of my sample because they're money losing companies. And that's not uncommon. In fact, every year that I've done this, and I've done this for 26 years, every year with PE ratios, you lose about 55 to 60% of the sample right off the top. We'll come back to that because that might create some bias in, in the remaining companies. The average PE ratio for a US company was 114. 
That's kind of scary number, 114. But before you get too freaked out, the reason it's so high is there's one company with a P-E ratio of 134,400. And it's one highly priced stock, right? It was actually trading at about eight to nine dollars, but because the earnings per share dropped to a fraction of a cent, the P-E ratio exploded out. Do you see what's happening in my average? That outlier is pulling the number way out towards it. In fact, a more meaningful number, and this is what I was taught in my statistics class, we have an asymmetric distribution, is I was told to use the median. The median P-E ratio for a U.S. company is 21.5 cents. If I asked you to describe in words to somebody who's not a statistics person what that 21.57 is, exactly how would you describe it? You want to try? What, what, how would I describe it to somebody? 21.57 median without using statistics. The number that occurs the most. Actually, that's a mode. Mode would be the number that occurs the most. The median is... Half of all companies with P-E ratios in the U.S. have P-E ratios less than that number, so it's actually the 50th percentile. Of companies that have P-E ratios, you have to be very specific, because remember, you lost 4,000. The true median for a U.S. company is actually zero. You see why? Because if I took the entire middle of the distribution, I counted all 7,330 companies, if more than half have P-E ratios. So this is a nice trick question to ask. What's the median P-E ratio for a U.S. company? It's zero. Why? Because there are no comp the companies that have no P-E ratios essentially outnumber the ones that have. So among the companies that have P-E ratios, the median is 21.57. How would I use this? You come to me with a stock with a P-E ratio of 18 today. And you say, is that a high number? Is that a low number? I'm going to compare it to the median, not the average, not the mode. This is the number that tells me whether a P-E ratio is a high number or a low number. Let me keep going. The 25th percentile is 14.33. What does that tell you? 25% of all companies with P-E ratio in the U.S. have a P-E ratio less than 14. So if your stock has a P-E ratio of 11 or 12, right now, that's a cheap stock. I'm going to argue that if you have the entire distribution in front of you, you can create your own rules of thumb. You can tell me what's cheap or expensive on a pricing basis just looking at the distribution. One final question about, um, uh, about the numbers. As you go through... As I go from current P to trailing P to forward P, notice I start losing even more companies, especially with forward P. So why do I lose another 550 companies when I go from current P to forward P? What is forward P again? Somebody remind me. It's price today divided by expected earnings per share in the next four quarters. So where do I get that number, you think? For 7,330 companies. I'm not sitting there projecting earnings for each company. That would drive me crazy. So where do you think I go looking for those expected earnings per share numbers? Companies actually don't project their earnings for the most part for the next year. It's analysts who track companies who project the earnings. So what I'm looking for is an analyst estimate of earnings per share next year. So guess what those 550 companies that I lost were? They were companies that were not followed by analysts, and I threw them out of the sample. We create bias in the most subtle ways when we do pricing. Here's the first bias. When I threw out those money-losing companies from my sample, which is what I did when I threw out the 4,000 companies, I was introducing bias already, right? Because what kinds of companies lose money? They tend to be young companies, distressed companies, companies in trouble. I've taken them out of my sample. What's left then is a subset of healthier, larger companies. By going to forward PE, I made it an even smaller subset of companies that have analysts following them, which tend to be liquid companies that are held by institutional investors. That's the first step in the process of understanding what the numbers tell you about a multiple. So that's the first, first step. Let's keep going with what these numbers tell you. I used to do this just for U.S. companies for a long time, so because that's what I had data for. So I did it in 92 and 93. But in the late 90s or even the, first, the early part of the last decade, when I went to Mumbai or Sao Paulo and I showed that distribution for U.S. stocks and I said, you know what, P-E ratios have this skewed distribution. A grizzled veteran, usually an analyst who's been around 30 years in that market, would put up his hand and say, it doesn't look like that in Brazil. So what doesn't look like that? So if you did a distribution like this of Brazilian P-E ratios, they wouldn't look like this. So how would you know? It's just gut feeling. And after about the fifth or sixth time of an analyst saying, just trust me, it doesn't look like this, I said, okay, let me go check out what the distributions look like globally. So starting about a decade ago, I started doing these distributions, not just for the U.S., but for every market. 
So this is actually what you saw for the US. And in every market, if you look, the peak is to the left, the tail is to the right. But there's an interesting way of comparing across stocks, which looks at the 25th percentile, the median, and the 75th percentile. Start of 2017, if you ask me what the most expensive market in the world is, I'm just going to compare the median PEs. The median PE for the US is much higher than it is in the rest of the world. If you ask me what the cheapest market is at the start of 2017, it's Japan with a median PE of 13.86. On every single quartile and, and, and median, you see that Japanese stocks trade at lower multiples. The reason we look at data is to make sure that we're on the right track when we say a stock is cheap. What does this mean? If I come to you with a Japanese stock with a PE ratio of 14, you compare to the US numbers, it's going to look cheap to you. But if you compare to Japanese numbers, it's actually an expensive stock. It's more than the median. So it's, it's very simple to do because the data is that you have access to S&P Capital IQ. That's all I did was I collected the raw data, computed the multiples, and put up the distribution. Any questions on this is the basic statistics of what I'm trying to do here? Sometimes the differences can tell you something about differences across companies. January 2013, for instance, when I did this across markets, notice the outlier. So if you look at this is median price to book, market value of equity divided by book value of equity. You look across markets, the US was the most expensive, trading at 1.5 to 4 times book value. Look at Japan. The median Japanese stock was trading at two-thirds of book value. It's clearly out of the norm, right? So essentially for the last four or five years, you look at Japanese stocks, they've essentially looked much, much cheaper than the rest of the market. Don't jump to the next conclusion, therefore I should buy these stocks. One of the things we're going to explore is why Japanese stocks might trade at lower multiples than the rest of the world. But at least looking at the data, you're getting a sense of that difference across the world. One final use for all these distributions is, you know, you see rules of thumb. If you worked on Wall Street on an internship during the summer, you see these rules of thumb passing through. Stock that trades at less than 12 times earnings is cheap. A stock that trades at less than book value is cheap. An EV to EBITDA multiple less than six is cheap. And you wonder where these rules of thumb come from. I'm convinced with some guy leaving his office in the late 70s in Wall Street on his way to a bar, yelling out of a window, saying, from this time on, six times EBITDA is cheap, and it gets passed on generation to generation. There's no good reason. One of the things I find useful is when somebody gives me a rule of thumb, they walk into my office and say, six times EBITDA is cheap, right? I say, okay, let me count some companies for you. And what I do actually is count the number of companies that traded less than six times EBITDA. It's a very quick, sobering device against using a rule of thumb. In fact, in June of 2010, or January 2010, if you told me six times EBITDA was cheap, I'd come back to you and say half of all U.S. companies traded at multiples of less than six times EBITDA. Wasn't cheap in, June of in January 2010. In 2017, it might be cheap unless you happen to be in Japan. You see where I'm going next? We should, I mean, I don't see why we still use these rules of thumb. It doesn't make any sense anymore. We have the actual numbers in front of us. Let's actually use the data we have rather than making up rules of thumb. So define, describe, and describe sounds fancy until you realize we are applying basic statistics to these numbers and trying to address the question of what's cheap, what's expensive. Which brings me to the third step in this process. Embedded in every multiple are all of the assumptions you had to make in your discounted cash flow valuation. Like what? You had to make assumptions about cash flows, assumptions about growth, assumptions about risk, right? They were in your DCF. Whether you like it or not, in, in every multiple, those assumptions are there. So when you use a multiple, one of the things, and this is actually the best way to think about multiples, is to back out from the multiple what those variables are that drive the multiple. So I'm going to take you through a process of deconstructing multiples. Or if I gave you a multiple, you can use that multiple to back into the variables that will determine that multiple. And it requires that you remember basic discounted cash flow valuation, because here's how it's going to work. If I come to you with an equity multiple, here's what I want you to go back to. The simplest equity valuation model you can think of, which to me is the dividend discount model, a stable growth dividend discount model. So there it is. Then I'm going to essentially do some algebra where I'm going to divide both sides of the multiple by some number, earnings, book value. And when I'm done, I'm going to end up with an equation in a discounted cash flow world for a PE ratio, an EV to EBITDA, an EV to free cash flow to the firm. By the time I'm done, I should be able to tell you what the variables are that determine PE, what the variables are that determine EV to invested capital, 
rather than just guessing. I know it sounds abstract, so let's take P ratios. Equity multiple, right? I'm going to start with the stable growth dividend discount model. That's actually called the Gordon growth model. It's a stable growth dividend discount model. Expected dividends next year divided by cost of equity minus the growth rate. So far, I haven't done any multiples, right? That's just a DDM. If I divide both sides of that equation by the earnings per share, here's what I get. I divide price by earnings per share, I end up with the PE ratio. End up, I divide dividends by earnings per share, I get the payout ratio. I can actually argue that the PE ratio for a stable dividend paying firm is a function of three variables, the payout ratio, the cost of equity, and the expected growth rate. That's it. If you don't trust companies when they pay dividends, you say some companies hold back cash. You can replace dividends with free cash load equity, and all that will happen, instead of using the actual payout ratio, you're going to replace it with the potential payout ratio. The PE ratio for a stable company that pays dividends is a function of the payout ratio, the cost of equity, and the growth rate. Holding all else constant, as my growth goes up, my PE ratio will go up. Holding all else constant, the higher my cost of equity, the lower my PE ratio, because my discount rate is higher. And finally, holding all else constant, if I can afford to pay out more in dividends, that's like creating more quality growth, my P ratio should increase. It's a very simple mechanism for deconstructing a multiple and backing out those variables. So let's kind of expand this equation, because it's clearly an equation that works if you have a stable growth firm. Let's suppose I came to you with a high growth firm, a Cisco. Cisco's not really that high growth. A Google, right? And I say, Tell me what drives a PE ratio for a Facebook or Google and Apple. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to set up a high growth discounted cash flow model. Let's stay with the dividend discount model to keep things simple. This equation here looks like an elaborately complicated equation, but it's actually a present value equation. The value of a stock in a two-stage dividend discount model is the present value of the dividends during the high growth phase. That's the first part of the equation. And the second one is actually the terminal value. So it's what we normally do in a spreadsheet written as an equation. One of the questions you like to know the answer to when you look at a, PE, when you look at a multiple is, as a variable changes, how will the PE ratio change? How will the price to book change? I'm going to argue by setting this up as an equation, I'm setting myself to be able to answer that question. Because here's what I did. I divide both sides of the equation by the earnings per share. I end up with a PE ratio for a high growth firm. And I'm going to list the three variables that determine the PE ratio for a high growth firm. You tell me whether they sound familiar. The price earnings ratio for a high growth firm is a function of its payout ratio, its cost of equity, and the expected growth rate. When I did my stable growth firm, what did I get? Payout ratio, cost of equity, and expected growth rate. All that's different about doing a high growth firm is I have to estimate those three variables twice. And if I can estimate those two variables twice, I can tell you what the PE ratio should be for a 20% growth, a 50% growth, or an 80% growth rate for. In fact, let's stay on that equation. I know math is way back in our past. Right? But one of the questions I said we need to know the answer to is growth changes, how will the PE change? I've given you the equation for PE there, right? You remember high school calculus? I know you don't, but no, remember that class that you kind of buried way back in... If this were a calculus class and I gave you that equation for the PE ratio and asked you how as growth changes will the PE change, what am I asking you to do? What in calculus answers that question? Take the first differential of this equation and you've got, I know that you've forgotten your calculus, but if you buy Mathematica, which you can buy at the student cost, you can actually enter the equation and do the first derivative, the second derivative. Yeah. It's actually a very impressive way to start breaking equations down because you can say as risk changes, how will the PE change as growth change? No, but it's very high tech for people who don't remember their calculus. So I'm going to give you a much simpler way of trying to answer this question. I'm going to do it by using a hypothetical company. So here's what my hypothetical company is going to look like. It's a high growth company. And here's what the next five years look like. They're going to grow 25% a year for the next five years while paying out 20% of their earnings as dividends. So they have a payout ratio of 20%, a growth rate of 25%. Let's keep the beta 1 in both the high growth and the stable growth period. So the beta stays the same. But at the end of five years, the company becomes a stable growth firm. Let's say the growth rate that the company will have in stable growth is 8%. Its payout ratio jumps now that its growth rate has dropped to 50%. Let's say the beta stays at 1. So the risk-free rate is 6%. The risk premium is 55 I've got a cost of equity of 11.5%. So here's what I have. 
During my high growth period, my growth rate is 25%, my payout ratio is 20%, my cost of equity is 11.5%. I plug those numbers in. In stable growth, my growth rate becomes 8%, my payout ratio becomes 50%, and my cost of equity stays at 11.5%. I plug them into that equation that you saw on this page, and what I get as my predicted PE ratio for this company is 28.75. You're saying, what does it even mean? If I would used a two-stage dividend discount model to value the stock, that's what the value per share would have been. So essentially, this is just restating a dividend discount model in terms of a PE ratio. You say, why would I be willing to pay? Why would you be willing to pay a high PE ratio for this company? What is it that makes this company an attractive company? The fact that its growth rate is 25%, right? You're willing to pay a high PE because the growth rate is 25%. What's your nightmare scenario in buying a growth company? You pay 28.75 times earnings, you buy the company, and what could happen tomorrow? You could wake up and find out that there is no growth, right? Let's, play, let's make that nightmare come, come true. Let's suppose you buy this company for 28.75 times earnings, and tomorrow you wake up, and you discover that your actual expected growth rate could be lower than 25%, 20%, 15%, 10%. So basically, I've looked at... You could also wake up to a pleasant surprise, right? You could buy a company expecting 25% growth and wake up to 30, 35, 40. So all I've done in this, in this table is held everything else constant and changed just my growth rate in that first five-year period. No surprises here. As my growth increases, my PE ratio increases. You see, why are there four columns here? I looked at four interest rate scenarios. From 4% T-bond rates to 10% T-bond rates, low to high. Under every scenario, the P-E ratio increases as growth increases, but here's what I, the difference is. As my interest rates become higher and higher, my P-E ratio becomes less and less sensitive to changes in my growth rate. In other words, when interest rates are high, I don't seem to care as much about growth when I set the P-E ratio for a stock. Why is that? Why, when interest rates are high, does growth seem to matter less in my P-E ratio? It's actually a very simple answer. Think about what the value of growth is, and the answer should be right there in front of you. What's the value of growth? It's all in the future, present value, right? As interest rates rise, what happens at present value? It goes down. You say, how much could it go down? Put yourself in Brazil in 1991. You know what interest rates were? 5,500%. Let me ask you a question. How much is growth worth when interest rates are 5,500%? Close to nothing. What if I surprise you and say my growth doubled? You say, it's still nothing. As interest rates go up, I become less and less willing to pay for growth. So surprises about growth matter less to me at high interest rates as opposed to low interest rates. So what environment are we in right now in the U.S.? A high interest rate environment or a low interest rate environment? It's a low interest rate environment. Let's carry this to the next step. How do these surprises about growth manifest themselves? If you're an investor, you buy a high growth stock. What is, the, what is the mechanism by which you find out that growth is not going to be as high as you thought it was? What's usually the delivery mechanism for that news? How do you find that out? Earnings. An earnings announcement, right? Basically, you hold the stock and you say, I expect the earnings to go up 50%, and the company comes out and says, you know what, we lost to zero. It's only 5%. It's a negative surprise, right? You know what this graph is telling you? When there is an earnings announcement surprise, the effect of that surprise will be much higher now because interest rates are low than they used to be 10 years ago, 20 years ago. The same surprise is going to have a much bigger impact on your stock price because the present value of growth is a much bigger part of your total value. Earnings surprises have become, you know, the effect on stock price have become larger over time. And people argue that it's because markets are less efficient. It's got little to do with market efficiency. It's got everything to do with the fact that our T-bond rate now is 2% as opposed to 4.5% 10 years ago and 6.5% 20 years ago and 10% 30 years ago. As interest rates change, the effect of earnings surprises is going to become, is also going to change depending on the level of rates. So it's actually a very simple implication that comes from just playing with a hypothetical company. I did one more what if. I said, what if the company gets riskier? Same growth rate, whatever. And again, the answer is not surprising. As I keep the growth rate the same and I increase my beta, 
riskier stocks, you tend to pay a lower P ratio for the same growth rate. Why? Because that growth is worth less because the risk has gone up. So I'm going to do a what if here. Let's assume you're the CEO of a company. You're a very risky company, your beta is two, and your growth rate is, let's say, 20%. So you're a high growth, high risk company. And right now you're way out at the end of the graph, and your price earnings ratio is about eight, and you're very disappointed. So you come to me for some advice. You say, I want to increase my price earnings ratio. What can I do? The first way you can increase your price earnings ratio is for, by, by going for more growth, right? But if you go for more growth, you're stuck in this last section. There's not much room to run. What's the other way you can increase your price earnings ratio instead of going for more growth? Go for less risk. And the payoff there is actually much greater than going for more growth. It's an insight that many growth companies don't seem to get. They get so focused on growth and more growth and still more growth that they forget that the risk variable might actually deliver a much bigger payoff. In fact, if you look at Amazon's history, that's the insight that Jeff Bezos had in 2000 that allowed Amazon to survive. He said, forget about growth. Let's survive. Let's make sure we get through this, because if we don't do that, it doesn't matter how high growth is. It's a trade-off you have to think about when you think about PE and growth. So let me summarize. When you look at a PE ratio for a company, and I said, this stock is cheap because it trades at six times earnings. There are three questions you need to ask me to make sure the stock is cheap. So ask me the three questions. I've given you the insight into what the three questions are. What's the first question you can ask me? I'm sorry? Earnings, earnings are good, but, but uh, it's not. But the current earnings I've already built into PE. So remember, you're looking for a mismatch. So when I say the PE ratio is low, the first question you're going to ask me is, what's my growth rate, right? And if I say my growth rate is minus 5%, there's your answer for why this. So now I've given you the template. So first question you're going to ask me is what's the growth rate? What's the next question? Anna? What's the risk of the company? Because, it doesn't, because I might not even think in terms of, because remember, we're now in the pricing realm. We're no longer DCF people. So if you're talking to an analyst, you're going to say, how risky is this company? And most of the time, what's the answer you're going to get when the stock is trading at six times earnings? It's a very risky stock. And the third question you should ask me, and this is related to the payout ratio, is how do you get a high payout ratio with a, with a high growth rate? You have to have a high return in equity. So the third question you're going to ask me is, what's my return in equity? Most of the time, when you see a stock trade at a low P, it deserves to trade at a low P. It's trading at a low P either because it's really low growth, or really high risk, or really terrible returns in equity. So I'm going to ask you a follow-up question. If you wanted a perfect cheap stock on a P-E ratio basis, you want a stock with low P-E. You want a stock with a low, low growth rate or a high growth rate? If you want something that's really cheap and you want to actually add it to your portfolio, you want low growth or high growth? You want high growth because you don't want anything that explains away the low P-E. So you want low P-E and high growth. So I've kind of given you the next step. I'm going to ask you, do you want low risk or high risk? What do you want? When you got a 50-50 shot at least. You want low risk, right? Because if you say high risk, it explains. So remember, you don't want anything that explains the way. You want low PE, you want high growth, you want low risk. Low return equity or high return equity? You want a high return equity. So this is what you're looking for. You want a low PE, you want high growth, you want low risk and a high return equity. You're saying, what chance do I have of finding something like that? No harm looking. <laughs> That's why you screen for stocks. Go into the S&P Capital IQ, you have access to it. This is easy to do, right? You can screen for every stock with a P-E ratio less than 10. You're going to find thousands of stocks. You say, what the hell am I going to do? Look for stocks then with a growth rate greater than 15%. Your sample will go from thousands of stocks to hundreds of stocks. Now you've got something that's more. Then look, you choose whatever measure of risk you want. You want betas? Look for stocks with betas less than one. Your hundreds will become maybe 80 stocks. Then ask, I want only stocks which make a return equity more than 25%. You might end up with like 25 stocks. Don't be crazy and just buy the stocks blindly. But this is how you can kind of zero in on stocks that are most likely to be misvalued. Yeah. So you told us that the three critical factors in the P ratio right. are... Go ahead. Um, you don't have to look back, so okay, growth, so growth risk, um, risk, and the payout ratio. And, and, but the payout ratio is a derived... You see why? Because to have a high payout ratio for a given growth rate, what do I need? High return equity. So you can use payout ratio or return equity interchangeably. I prefer return equity simply because it's a more generic variable. Right? Okay, so um, if we're looking for stocks, like schemes or yeah. stocks where all three of those are uh, good, yeah. so 
but make sure you also screen for low PE, right? So there are four screens you need to run. You want low PE, high growth, low risk, and high return in equity. Don't you have an impossible 70 because if those three were all... Well, how, you won't find out till you look, right? Maybe it is impossible and after looking you might find nothing. There are 7,330 stocks. You're hoping that one of them at least comes through. If nothing comes through, nothing's lost. It took you three minutes to run it on capital IQ. But if something comes through, take a closer look. I can't guarantee you. You're right. It could be the market is efficient, that every high growth stock rate is a high PE ratio. But the essence of pricing is what? That you think markets make mistakes in pricing stocks relative to each other, and you're hoping to catch that with your screens. Right? Okay. See, but remember, positively is based on what you compare it to, because you said high growth. high growth. What did you use as your growth rate cutoff? Let's say you put in 25% and nothing came through. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do next? Try 15%. Do you see where I'm going? You can never get zero because you set the parameters that you use to define high growth and low risk. So if you, can, if you get nothing with your first screens, maybe you're looking for the impossible. You're, maybe you're looking for stocks with a P-E ratio less than 5, a growth rate greater than 100% no risk, and a return equity of 50%. You're probably right, you will find nothing. But if you take a PE ratio less than eight, a growth rate higher than 20%, a beta less than one, and a return equity greater than 15%, you're going to find some. So you might have to play with the screens. The first time you run a screen is just a starting point. Look to see how many you get. An S&P Capital IQ will actually tell you seven stocks past the screen, or 70 stocks past the screen. So you can actually change the screens until you get stocks coming through. But what you're trying to do is you're saying, this, these are the variables I want in my stock. And I'm going to try to find, as best as I can, companies that meet those criteria. Okay, and if the three factors explain most of the variation? It should explain all of the fundamental variation. Okay. You know what it doesn't explain? Craziness, momentum, mood. But if your job is to pick stocks based on the fundamentals, this, this is it. These are the three. There, there's nothing else because that's all is in the equation. Okay. Yeah. That's so. so there's some variation not explained, then it's because of these factors. Move to exactly. Okay. It's a pricing game. That's exactly right. Right. And what are you hoping for then? You're hoping that the mood shifts or the mood changes, and you're going back to fundamentals. So you're still trusting markets to correct their mistakes, but you're playing the pricing game. In fact, I'll tell you how I use it, right? Let's say at the start of the year, you want to find five cheap stocks, and you believe in discounted cash flow valuation. That's how you pick stocks. Do you see the challenge you face? There are 7,330 stocks. If you move alphabetically from A through Z, saying, I'm going to find five cheap stocks, you're never going to get there. There are too many stocks. So what you do is you use screens to kind of narrow down 50 stocks that are interesting based on the mismatch. And then you do your discounted cash flow valuation on those 50. It lets you narrow your focus, because otherwise you're distracted. You say, that looks cheap, that looks cheap. And the next thing you know, you have no idea what you're doing, so you get stuck. So basically, this is my way of kind of narrowing my focus, saying these are the stocks that are most likely to find something interesting. So I'm going to let you play the role of an analyst. So basically, this is going to be the start, and of course, we'll continue in the next session. I'm going to play the role of a really naive analyst. Now, I'm going to put out all these recommendations that are horribly wrong. And I think you already know enough about PE ratios to catch me on my mistakes. So you ready? Let's try first. I'm an analyst who compares PE ratios across emerging markets. So this is March of 2014, pre-Ukraine. Desire before Russia wandered into Ukraine. So, you know. so I want to make sure that you can't say, oh, it's the Ukraine crisis that, that created. So, pre Ukraine. I'm going to tell you Russian stocks look really cheap. And my only basis for that is Russian stocks trade at four times earnings. That sounds interesting, right? Four times earnings. The US is 21 times earnings. So, ask me the questions you're going to ask before you decide. So, I put out a recommendation buy Russian stocks, they're cheap, they trade at four times earnings. What's the growth? I have no idea. Russian companies are very opaque. I have no, no idea how fast they grew in the past. Already you can see one of the problems is if your earnings are very opaque, your financial statements are not full. I don't, and also, Russia, for better or worse, is very much tied to oil prices. Right? 
So even if I told you a historical growth rate, what else are you looking at? You're looking at oil prices and saying, so the growth is probably going to be pretty bad, not because of any political risk, but because of the fact that oil prices are low, and that's going to drag down a big chunk of earnings. So growth is probably going to be bad. What's the next question you're going to ask? What's the risk? You don't even have to ask. It's Russia. right? So we can jump to the third question. What kind of return in equity do companies make? Again, let's say they make bad returns in equity. What's the problem you're going to face with Russian companies? Even if you know, usually with bad companies, bad returns in equity, you try to change the management of the company, right? Don't try that with Russian companies. Bad things can happen to you. Already you can see that markets that look cheap have good reasons for looking cheap. So sometimes it's just interesting. You take, I mean, you can get this data pretty much anywhere across markets. Take a look at the cheapest market. The cheapest market in the world today is Venezuela. Would you really? If I told you, you can buy Venezuelan companies for three times earnings. People are not exactly lining up saying, that's a bargain. It's not, because given the risk and the both political and economic risk in Venezuela, you'd be crazy even at three times earnings to just jump in. So. You can already see comparing P-E ratios across markets is going to be messy. Let me do one final example, just to kind of illustrate one of the ways you might be able to control across markets. This is way back in time, June of 2000. I put up the P-E ratios for a bunch of then emerging markets. Okay. So basically, you see the P-E ratio in the, first col in the second column. And if I pick just based on P-E ratio, the cheapest market in the world would have been Turkey, followed by Argentina, and then you'd have risen up the ranks. But I'm going to give you three pieces of information on these, on these countries. So these are country numbers that might lead you to reassess. The first is I've given you the level of interest rates across the countries. Very different, obviously, higher in some countries than others. The second is I've given you the real growth in each of these countries. And some countries have high growth and others have low growth. And the third is I've given you a number that measures country risk. And the higher that number, a riskier a country. So again, I'm going to ask you the same question I asked you about an individual company. If you want to pick a cheap country, you want a low PE, right? So that's easy. You want low interest rates or high interest rates? You want low interest rates because high interest rates can explain. So you want low PE, low interest rates. You want high growth or low growth? You're kind of getting it. It's high growth. And you want low risk or high risk? You want low risk. So basically, you're looking for a country with low PE, low interest rates, you can start eyeballing the data, but you're going to start to get really dizzy really fast. So here's how I pulled out my statistics book. And remember that multiple regression chapter, where basically I have a dependent variable and independent variables? I took the PE ratios of my countries and ran a regression against interest rates, GDP growth, and country risk. And the coefficients actually are what I'd expect them to be. The higher the interest rate, the lower the PE. The higher the growth rate, the higher the PE. And the higher the country risk, the lower the P. So if I have this regression equation, how would I use it to find cheap and expensive countries? What do I need to do? Let's go back and look at Argentina. I have interest rates, GDP, growth, and country risk for Argentina, right? If I plug those numbers into my regression equation, I'll get a predicted PE for Argentina, and that number works out to be 13.57. Given Argentina's high interest rates, real growth, and high country risk, the PE ratio should be 13.5, so it's actually trading at 14 times earnings. That makes Argentina slightly overvalued, even though the PE ratio looks low. And I do that for every country. So next session, when we start off, you're going to see me draw on multiple regressions, not in some elaborate sense, but as a way of controlling for differences across companies and countries. Yeah. Quick question. Uh, Tesla just like like a uh, new report that they sold six and a half percent more cars in the first quarter than the last year. Uh, I don't know, six and a half percent more. Yes. Yeah. 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 But can I put that? How do I put that? Because the only thing I have. What does it change? Does it change your own game? Does it change your million cars if you keep it 10 million cars? No. It just means that they might be. Because you need to make the actual. You might actually put it on. You might actually put it on.
It's freaking me out because they're trading at like 290 now. They went up, they also, they went up like crazy. Yeah, that's they're trading at like 290. That's surprising. Yeah. Uh, so I think in the now this is Okay. Does this change my fundamental story? Does it mean they're going to sell? If there was something in the story that would lead you to think that they can sell three million cars rather than one million cars, mm -hmm. that could change the message. Yeah. So that's a question you want to ask yourself. They could be some story. Does it change my story about revenue? Does it change my story about margins? Okay. Does it change my story about the risk? Of the and once you ask those questions, the answers are not really, 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 Everything isn't it a trade off? Though? Isn't that the way finance goes? You do price, you look for a cheap stock. You don't want finance. So, the question of what you should expect to see is what we're getting from that intrinsic view of price. You could actually see what people are actually saying. So, you could test that today and you can see what price you What's that? Right? Yeah, so, so uh, wouldn't everyone just invest in all these stocks which you like these? Well, you might have to see what the guarantee.